You're listening to The Drive Home. Alrighty, gang, it's 4.30 on The Drive Home for Thursday. Wayne, Tanya, and Brian all alongside. Right on. And by the way, Tanya, here before we get to our guest, I figured out why it is that Brian dressed up today. Why? I know now. Oh, this ought to be good. Because he knew that we have an esteemed guest, Dr. Ryan Jennings, <laughs> Chief Medical Officer of HSHS St. Anthony Memorial Hospital, joins us this <laughs> afternoon. Uh-huh. And Dr. Brian really did dress up yeah. today. He did. He dressed up just for you. Boy, and he's got a face made for radio, so... <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> All I can say is, you're welcome. <laughs> oh, See, I love that about you, because you, know you, you know how to work on people and burn them at the same time, Doc. It's great. <laughs> Youch. Oh, that's great. How are things going, Dr. Jennings? No, we're doing good. We're doing good. Beautiful weather, starting to, starting to get a little nicer out, and uh, you know, now got a little bit of more formal direction on hopefully where we're going over the next few weeks. Yeah, Illinois announced the phased reopening of the state. Um, there's been some conjecture here about how to do that really well and back and forth, and that's going to happen as all things do. Mm-hmm. Um, but so in talking about that with COVID-19 coronavirus, uh, new numbers out today from the Department of Public Health, 2,641 new cases in the state today along in the last 24 hours, along with 138 additional deaths reported statewide. 107 of those from up in Cook County. Um, so there we are with what seems like higher numbers a lot lately. Is that because of increased testing, obviously? Certainly the positive test numbers really relate to increased testing, and, and uh, that's good and bad news. You know, part of the requirements on how uh, the state gets to reopen as we start out now in what they're calling the flattening phase, you know, the whole state was declared to be in the flattening phase, and, and then over the next 28 days, starting on from, from May 1st, having to demonstrate a plateau or even improvement in the percentage of positive cases. So actually that could help us as long as there's a low prevalence of disease in the region. Uh, then the percentage of, a poly- of, of positives will go down. Uh, there will be fewer out of the hole, which means we'll be looking favorable to continue to move towards the next phase. Uh, the second part of that, of course, is uh, the number of patients being admitted into the hospital with COVID or suspected COVID-like illness. Uh, and knock on wood, hopefully that will continue to trend down. And then the third one, which I really think is the more important criteria, is looking at the utilization of resources and being able to see how many hospital beds are open, how many ICU beds are open, how many ventilators are in use. Hmm. And those numbers have stayed, uh, you know, relatively flat uh, and even improved even in, in Cook County area. So uh, knock on wood, uh, you know, the biggest thing that I think can throw a wrench is, you know, some of these congregate living outbreaks, the, the nursing home outbreaks that could really uh, skew the numbers quickly. But they're looking at it as a whole regions. And so for the Effingham area, we're in, in region six, but we get combined with region three. So basically all the way across central Illinois. And they're not looking at individual hospitals or cities. They're actually looking at the aggregate numbers across all of that area. So uh, hopefully that will help to kind of, again, weigh out uh, some of those uh, one-offs so that we can continue to move forward. But while still locally, then uh, using your own due diligence to make decisions at a local level. So I think you know, the state tried to think through a way to do this, uh, you know, in a way that at least made us separate from, you know, Cook County region, which is mm-hmm. much more uh, different scenario than the rest of the state. So recognizing the differences in the uh, in the environment across the state uh, and at the same time expecting people to be responsible in their local uh, region and, and municipalities. Okay. That sounds great. Now, um but I think, have you already started uh, scheduling for the elective surgeries that will begin, what, next week? We are. We're scheduling starting uh, Monday, starting May 11th. And, of course, the, the big new part of that is the requirement for testing of, of all of those folks before they undergo an elective type procedure. And that has to be done within 72 hours of the procedure itself. So there's a little... <laughs> <laughs> a, little, hmm. a little strategy that you have to get figured out to get the people on Monday tested on Friday and say, you know, when, okay. you know no, later, uh, no, no sooner, no later. So, yeah, there's a little bit of art to get in this. So we've actually spent a lot of time here in the last week figuring that out. Uh, at this point, it looks like, you know, we'll be having folks come get their testing at the uh, d- diagnostic center there in the new building, uh, building, building oh. B right there along the way. Yeah. Uh, so that they can get that done. They can get their education about surgery itself, get the 
soaps and stuff that we normally handed out when you came to the hospital. So uh, continue to, to do all of those things that have kept our patients safe previously. Uh, and, and then at the same time, adding this additional layer of protection by uh, doing the COVID testing. And at the same time, you know, continue to ask our colleagues to check sure they're well, checking their temperatures, those types of things, so that we minimize any possible risk of, uh, of uh, something untoward happening, making, making the hospital safe. Excellent. That, okay. That sounds great. Um, doc, so there's been there's been a lot of conjecture about this, and I'm going to throw one at you cold. I know you love these cold fastballs, but this just came to me. <laughs> there's There's been a lot of conjecture in the news and in the media all over the place about this. Uh, two things. So this is a, this is a dual question for you. Uh, one, what's your opinion on this take on herd mentality, that it would be best for people to possibly go ahead and get COVID and get that Im- herd immunity built up and then secondly, do you think it's it's there's been also a lot of conjecture about whether we should or should not be wearing masks is specifically in public places? So so the first question is actually, you know, it's it's really great if we could ever get to herd immunity. Uh, you know, that that is the goal and that's what happens with any of these outbreaks is eventually there's just a large enough portion of the population that they don't get it and they don't spread it. And so you hit a certain point, you know, way back at the beginning when we when we talked about the the RO value, which was, you know, if I go out, how many people am I likely to infect? Mm-hmm. So remember that way back at the beginning, we talked about, you know, if yeah. a person comes out and they're infected at this point, they'll probably infect another three to four people. Mm-hmm. Well, as more and more people become immune, that RO value goes down. And once you hit the point that that becomes less than one, then eventually the disease burns itself out because you're going out and you're infecting less than one other person. And at that point, the disease starts to disappear. So herd immunity is definitely desirable, but this isn't a chicken pox party. <laughs> <laughs> well, know, uh, that's exactly what I was thinking was chicken pox. Significant. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, this is, this is no chicken pox party. This is the most, the, 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 the sequelae here and the likelihood of ending up hospitalized, potentially on a ventilator and even potentially dying is much different than some of those lower level viruses viruses that still can cause very serious harm, but that's where herd immunity becomes, you know, a very powerful tool. You just simply go get the disease, get over it, and go on. And unfortunately, you know, the whole point of trying to do the social distancing and all of the things that we've suffered through here has been to not overrun the healthcare resources. And so when we go back to the original question of how the governor is trying to measure uh, the staging of this, you know, that one big criteria about how much health care resources being utilized currently in the form of how many beds, how many ventilators, you know, what's the likelihood that we're going to accidentally overrun our health care system if this thing starts to tick up? Hmm. So, you yeah, know, herd immunity is definitely the goal. Uh, you get there in two ways, either native disease, like I said, where you go spread it, you know, people just gradually get it, uh, or through vaccination. And unfortunately, vaccination is still, uh, you know, quite a ways away. So, uh, so if I'm correctly hearing you, Doc, we're just not there yet. And it's not, it's, we're not there yet. We're not there yet, and, okay. and we're really struggling in even defining it. You know, we got a lot of energy and excitement around the antibody testing, uh, you know, when that first came out, because, again, that's the testing that's looking, did you have it and are you recovered from it yeah. and now have immunity? And, boy, they, they continue to, to really struggle with which of those tests are accurate. Of course, it's hard to know yet because, you know, we just don't have enough time to see if you have a certain level of, of these antibodies in your body are you going to still get the disease if you're exposed to it again? And we just haven't had enough time to really be able to intelligently comment on that. So mm-hmm. that'll come, and, of course, a vaccine undoubtedly will come. But uh, but for right now, it's more a question of, you know, do you continue these practices to minimize the spread of disease for fear of overcoming your health care resources, at the same time slowly opening back up so that you don't just all of a sudden swing the doors open and you've got a huge disaster. You know, let's open gradually. Let's see how it goes. Uh, I think the 28 days per phase seems like a long time if, if things really stay flat. But, uh, but you know, if it does start to light up, then, you know, we've got some, we've got some room for correction. Uh, to the question around masking, it really is, it goes right into the same question. Should we still be masking and for how long? Um, I, you know, right now it definitely, you know, was trying to, I think, uh, balance that act between opening some things up, but reducing the possibility that if you're a carrier, that you're not going to spread it to somebody else through a cough sneeze. So I think, you know, they were, they were trying to kind of, like I mentioned last time, trying to thread that needle 
of let's open up a little bit, but let's put in an additional layer of protection so that hopefully we don't see this explosion. In the governor's plan, the masking actually stays in place for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 I mean, I like tan lines, but boy, tan lines <laughs> on my face start to look a little silly after a while. So, so uh, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, I'm hoping that maybe as, as these do evolve, uh, you know, this was a first draft and, and we've already seen uh, many things that, uh, you know, came out one way and then they backed off and said, no, nah, wait a minute, that doesn't even make sense. So hopefully, you know, they'll, they'll gradually evolve the phases yeah. and, and kind of line those up more closely with what we truly see go on in the public once we start to open up. Very good. Uh, doctor, I've got a completely different question for you. We actually had this uh, from our last session. We just didn't get a chance to ask it. And I was totally unaware of this, and it's a, it's a different topic because it's dealing with um, government and money. Hmm, there we go. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what? They, what? They, have, they have ours. Yes, that, that, yeah. that's, that's a good point. Um, anyway, what, what someone had wondered was, and I had never heard of this, so I could be totally wrong, but th- they were asking this question uh, dealing with diagnosis, uh, dealing with the current situation. They had heard things of if someone is diagnosed with COVID-19 or uh, unfortunately possibly passing away from that, that uh, I don't even know who they meant, the state or the federal government or someone is reimbursing uh, medical agencies or possibly even a hospital uh, for that type of situation. Uh, oh, I would have oh, said sure, due, sure. due to a cr- the crisis and they want to help out, or I don't even know motivations, but I had just never heard of that, and so someone threw that question out at us. Uh, can you tell us anything about that? Is, is any of that true or all of that true or completely wrong? Well, it's sort of, it's, it's uh, as expected, the government's involved, so it's, it's fairly complicated. But, mm-hmm. uh, but when, you look at, uh, when you look at the way the federal government pays hospitals, uh, specifically hospitals, they actually pay based upon the diagnosis. They don't get a bill that's for four days, and they pay for four days of the hospital stay and the labs that were done and the medicines that were given. They look at averages nationwide and say for this particular diagnosis, whether that's pneumonia, that's heart failure, in this case that's COVID, then they assign a dollar amount that says COVID or heart failure gets paid $3,227. And it doesn't matter if you're there for two days or you're there for 25 days. So so you get this law of averages that, that is supposed to work out for hospitals, yeah. basically going, well, you're going to have some people that came in and they really weren't super duper sick. You're going to have others that were really sick. Uh, and at the end of the day, you're going to get a middle of the road payment. But then they don't have to go through individual claims and, and actually look for every aspirin and every Tylenol and every everything. They simply look at the diagnosis that was given at the end. So as we've mentioned on, I think, maybe this last week, we talked about the fact that uh, COVID tends to have very prolonged hospitalizations. That oh, yeah. You end up in the hospital and you end up on the ventilator, uh, especially most of these folks are staying on the ventilator for 10 to 14 days. Well, that's obviously incredibly expensive yeah. compared to what a normal pneumonia type scenario would be. So appropriately, then, what they've identified as the average payment for a COVID-based uh, disease uh, is higher than for uh, a simple pneumonia. So, yes, there's truth to the idea that when you look at uh, uh, COVID, maybe as, a, as compared to just any other lung or pneumonia or something like that, that uh, the, the reimbursement would be higher. Uh, but there's also then the balancing act that for many of those patients, uh, the amount of services they needed is much, much higher. Uh, and so really it's kind of an artifact of the fact that they don't pay as they go. They, they pay purely based upon a diagnosis. And, and then, you know, sometimes you win one and sometimes you lose one as a hospital on that as far as, as the compensation goes. You know, you're going to have some people yeah. that come in, they're not super sick, mm-hmm. and you make a little money on that one. And then you have somebody come in and they're on the ventilator for, for, for 15 days and, and you you know, you take a complete bath. And so, uh, you know, so the, the law of averages is supposed to apply. So it's, it is true, but it's really kind of a byproduct of just the way the government payer system works uh, specifically for hospitals. I don't know that there's any d- different reimbursement for uh, uh, clinics and office visits and things like that. I, if there is, I, I, I just don't know that. But, uh, but on the hospital side, that's how that works. Okay. Kind of confusing. Yeah. Yep. There you go. 
Well, the government's involved. So yeah. yeah. That, that, that part of it's... Nothing well, simple sure. when the government uh, <clears throat> kind of steps in. That's right. Hey, doctor, you had mentioned about the uh, elective surgeries coming up, and you've got a set date for that. Uh, as far as the other services and features of the, the hospital, I mean, you're kind of right there at, uh, at, at the, 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 the place uh, that we're talking about. Any other ideas about maybe reopenings of other things? Specifically, I'm thinking of convenient care and visiting hours. Exactly. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. We are currently evaluating when to the timing specifically for convenient care and for the other like diagnostic centers. We have opened up some limited hours in uh, Altamont, Newton, and some of those areas to try to slowly reopen. Uh, we're really trying to base that a lot on the volume that we're seeing in the emergency department because we mm. know as we see the emergency department volume start to increase because uh, you know it became very very low. I mean, yeah. Did a. But, and this is one of the things actually I wanted to touch on that I'd kind of forgotten about. But, you know, folks stayed away from the hospital, and, and they did a great job at that. Now we're actually seeing some folks coming in that have stayed away longer than they should have. Uh-oh. And, Uh-oh. and you know, now they have more serious complications or they had some type of, you know, stroke or something like that that they didn't come in for and because uh, they're afraid, and, and we understand that. But, uh, but folks need to be aware of, you know, if they think they're having those types of problems, heart attack, stroke, et cetera, the hospital is safe and it is the right place to go to uh, when uh, when they're having those types of symptoms. So the timing of opening up those lower acuity clinics is, is really looking at how much volume we're starting to see in the emergency department. Right now, that volume has been, you know, about 60% of, of a normal mm. uh, volume, but it is starting to come up. And so um, uh, I would anticipate hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see uh, reopening of those services, additional outpatient therapy services, uh, eventually things like um, uh, cardiac rehabilitation, et cetera, that uh, right now, you know, has been closed. And we sort of want to, sure want to get people back on the track there, but but that's also a population that's very fragile to accidentally have an exposure. So uh, so it's it's a balancing act between taking into consideration the population that's affected and uh, then the possibility of having, you know, a negative outcome uh, by reopening the service too soon. All right. Doc, uh, as always, you are such an incredible wealth of knowledge. I've said that before. It's it's <laughs> bears repeating, obviously. And I I got to not to butter your bread, but I tell you, I love the fact that you do facts over fear. You take the political side out of it, which has been way too politicized with this, and you just lay it out there, the facts, and it's great. So, yes, thanks as always. No, very much appreciated, and thank you to WXF for giving us the time to do it. And, all right. and next time we're all three dressing up when you talk to us. <laughs> How do you know I'm not dressed? I have a tie on right now. But you I do? do? <laughs> I do not. Oh. <laughs> well, we'll three-piece suit it next time yeah. for you, Doc. So yes. We appreciate it as always, Doctor. Thank you. You guys have a great week. All you right, too. you Thanks too. Thanks again. There's, as always, Dr. Ryan Jennings, Chief Medical Officer of HSHS St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital here in Effingham, here to talk COVID-19 with us. We're going to get this up on the website here soon, but great information from yep. Dr. as always. Yes, as always.